So in our previous unit, we were looking at a very cursory overview of biology uh, using this as our guide, the Astrobiology Institute's Limits of Organic Life and Planetary Systems, to get a sense for what life was like and how scientists think. And <clears throat> you probably already figured out that this sort of forms one of the real central documents of this course. This is really kind of organizing the way we're thinking and the way we're approaching this science. So there's one part that we left at. We talked about metabolism controlled by enzymes, and we've still got a lot more to talk about with that. But this was a part of that statement that we sort of skipped over, and that was because this is a big, big can of worms if we're going to open it up, and that's what we're going to do right now. These enzymes are inherited through, through reproduction, and we've talked about what reproduction is. Reproduction, in the case of a living organism, is not just that it can be copied, but that it is capable of copying itself. So I can have a pen and another identical pen. Those are not, that's not reproduction in the sense of biological reproduction because the pens don't make new pens. But a baby human is because humans make baby humans make new humans. So this is the point, and this is leading to one of the oldest sciences, potentially with maybe the exception of astronomy, the oldest science in all of humanity. And really, this is where you learn genetics, right here. I want you to look at this picture, and you can see this nice bucolic picture of a person who lives along the coast, and he's got these herd dogs, and he's got this big herd of cattle, and there he is with one of his dogs. Uh, and I want to talk about him just for a moment. So this guy, this picture was painted, I'm not sure exactly when, but the scene itself could be from the 19th century, early 20th century, in a very rural area of the UK. And the question that I want to address is this, what does this guy know? Now, one of the things you may not realize is he's a geneticist. In fact, he knows a heck of a lot more about genetics than an undergraduate biology student at Arizona State University or even Stanford or Berkeley. Not because our universities aren't good. It's because he absolutely depends on his knowledge of genetics for his life. If a student at Berkeley doesn't know genetics, they fail an exam. If he doesn't know genetics, he and his entire family dies. He has to know what happens when these cows uh, reproduce with these bulls. He has to be able to predict what kind of traits they're going to get. Some of them are going to be able to produce milk like crazy in good years, but not in bad years, not in years where there's not much rain or not much nutrition. Whereas other cows can survive those time periods where there's a famine of some sort or there's a drought. And he's got to have all of this mixture in his herd all the time because if something bad happens, he can't have his entire herd wiped out by that bad catastrophic event. Some of them have to survive. And they have. I know they have because he's still alive and he is the latest in a generation after generation after generation of people who survived on these cattle. So he not only knows a lot of genetics, he's a genius at it. He really is excellent at it. So again, I'm not knocking undergraduate students at universities in the United States. Same is true in, else, in other countries as well. It's just that they don't have to know what he knows. So genetics is a really, really old science. It's what really has allowed us to become agricultural. And so this is what I want to focus on. I want to look at some of the ways in which he would have thought about the process because actually it's not a bad way of looking at it. But before we do that, let's introduce some terms that he didn't have. The basic concepts are things that you've heard of before. I just want to make sure we're starting off with the correct definitions of these things. What happens with scientific terms when they get used in the general population is they change in their meaning. And often they become ambiguous and unclear. And in science, we have to have very clear language because when we're talking about things that are complex in their logic, we have to have very clear concepts to make sure that the logical connections and relationships are, are, are obvious. Okay, so what we're going to be studying here is what we call biological inheritance. And inheritance in this sense, we just simply call it inheritance, is transmission of qualities from parent to offspring. Okay, so for example, we go back up to this picture. If this bull breeds with this white cow, what kind of offspring are we going to get? Well, he's a dark uh, bull with a black head and, the, and shoulders and, and brown coat. She's all white. What would happen if you bred those two together? 
That's the question that we're asking with biological inheritance. So <clears throat> the concept of inheritance really is nothing more than the fact that the parents tend to resemble their offspring. But what is it that they resemble? What exactly is it about them that they, that, that, that res that's the resemblance? Like, for example, in human beings, you can have a mother who has pierced ears and a daughter who eventually gets pierced ears, but that's not inheritance. She didn't inherit the pierced ears. What we're talking about here are traits. In inheritance, we're talking about inheritance of traits. And a trait, by definition, is a characteristic that literally is passed from parent to offspring. Pierced ears are not. If a woman gets her ears pierced or a guy gets his ears pierced and they have children, they don't expect their children to be born with pierced ears. So that's different than what we're talking about. That's not a trait, having pierced ears. However, if they're both really, really light blonde or very, very black hair, they expect their children to be blonde or black, respectively. That is inheritance, and that's the idea. So this whole study, the discipline that we use to study these kinds of inherited traits, is, this, is the branch of biology called genetics. And this is really all genetics is. It studies the heredity, the hereditary information being passed from parent to offspring. Now that's really twofold. One question is why is it that people who have black hair tend to have ch children with black hair? That's one question. But the other question is this. Why is it that people with jet black hair has a, have a child with maybe brown hair, which is different than them? That's variation. That's difference among individuals that is related to inheritance. Because here's the point, not every single trait is inherited and not an, an inheritance isn't perfect. If it were, then your mother and your father would look identical and you would look just like them. We'd all be like clones of each other, but we're not. Genetic studies those mechanisms as well. And there's really, again, sort of two levels of the study of genetics. One is what we call transmission genetics. And that's what I've been talking about here. If this bull ble breeds with that cow, what color offspring coats are we going to get? That's transmission. The patterns that you see when traits are passed from parent to offspring is what transmission genetics is. But more recently, in fact, this is really where modern biology is living at the moment, is molecular genetics. What is the mechanism? How is it that these traits are passed on and the patterns that they're passed on? What physically is happening? What is the molecule doing or molecules doing to cause those traits? The molecules involved, we've already seen. This is the central dogma that we talked about before. DNA gives, their, gives its information to RNA, which is then read by ribosomes to make protein. So DNA, RNA, protein, that central dogma, those are the mole molecules that are involved. And molecular gen genetics studies the functions of those molecules. All right, so let's go back to where that guy was doing his thing. Let's go back 180 years. <clears throat> and I want to go back into Europe in, say, the 1830s, 1835s, in that, that period of time. If you were to ask a farmer or a, uh, a, a herder or an academic, a scientist, professional scientist, what would you get from the following cross? Suppose I take a red-flowered plant and I cross it with a white-flowered plant so that they actually physically interbreed. If you were to ask them a question, that exact question, they would give you an answer which is generally very different than the answer I get when I ask that question to high school biology students and undergraduate biology students who have not had advanced genetics. The answers are extremely different. So again, 180 years ago, we go ask anybody who, again, is a farmer or a scientist, they're going to give a very different answer than a science student today at a modern university. And again, I'm not knocking on science students today, and I'm not mocking, uh, uh, hammering on uh, on modern universities, but the people back then, 180 years ago, would most likely have gotten it right, whereas the biology student would most likely have gotten it wrong. Largely because the way we teach it is a little bit misleading. The answer that most biology students today give me when I ask that question, I've done this before, is they say, well, depends on which is dominant, which is a good answer. Another one is, well, they usually tend to assume that the red is dominant, so they say, well, they're all going to be red. Okay, also not a bad answer. However, the vast majority of times when you breed a red flower with a white flower, in reality, not in your classroom and not in theory, you don't get red and you don't get white. You get pink. You get a mixture of the two. And that's what the answer would have been if you asked somebody back 180 years ago. They would have said, yeah, you almost certainly are going to get pink.
Now they knew that sometimes you didn't. They knew sometimes you got red, sometimes you got a mixture of red and white, sometimes you got something different. But the vast majority of times it would have gotten pink. This flies in the face of what we teach as genetics in high school and undergraduate biology courses, especially in general education. And so people walk away with the feeling that the people 180 years ago would have gotten it wrong, but they didn't, they would have gotten it right. Here's why, if you were to ask them 180 years ago, why is it that you would get pink? They would say, well, here's my theory. The idea is that this red plant, most of them would have said this, this red plant gives some sort of fluid. And that fluid you can think of is kind of red paint, a little blob of red paint. And this white plant gives a little blob of white paint. And so what happens then in genetics is you take these two fluids and you mix them together. And of course, if you take red and white paint and mix it together, it blends together to make pink. And that would have been their explanation. In fact, they even had a name for that explanation. It was called the generative fluid theory, the generative fluid idea. And it worked. They predicted. They were able to predict well enough that, for example, this guy that I introduced at the very beginning of the lecture could survive for generations after generation after generation. His whole family could. So this is different, though, than what we usually introduce as genetics because that theory turned out not to be correct. Even though it made the correct prediction most of the time, it doesn't make the correct prediction all of the time. And so we need to understand some stuff here. What is going on with this, with this generative fluid notion? Okay, well, let's do a thought experiment. Suppose I have a flower garden, and in that flower garden, I have red and white plants mixed. And some of the plants are male, some of the plants are female. Okay, now that's true. Plants can be male and female at the same, on the same organism. But in this case, well, I'm going to assume that they're different. And suppose I have exactly in my garden half male, half uh, female, and I have exactly half red and half white, and half the males are red, half are white, and half the females are red, half, are, half are, are white. Okay, so the way plants fertilize is that an insect will come flying along, and it lands on one of these flowers, and it lands on it randomly. So it has a 50-50 chance of landing on a red plant or a white plant, and it could be a male or a female. It doesn't matter if it starts on the female. It has to eventually get to a male first. Once it gets to the male, it goes into the flower and gets the nectar out of the base of the flower. And when that happens, the flower puts some pollen on it. Now, the pollen is carrying the sperm that's going to be used to fertilize the female. So again, 50-50 chance it's carrying red pollen or, or white pollen or pollen with the, with, from a red plant, pollen from a white plant. And then it bumbles along and flies and it lands on a female plant. 50-50 chance it lands on red or white. And when it does that, it goes into the, same, into the flower the same way before. But this time, instead of getting pollen, what it does is it scrapes the pollen off on the female portion of the plant that's going to get fertilized. Okay, so knowing all of that, what would we expect to happen in the next generation? What colors should we get in the next generation and in what proportions, assuming that our flower garden is really huge? So it's fairly easy to work out. If you work that out, you can think, okay, well... Some of the time, a bee is going to land on a red male plant, go to a red female plant, and if it's generative fluid, and that's the key, we're assuming it's generative fluid, if it's generative fluid, then red paint will mix with red paint, and the offspring will be red. Okay? Or white could fly to white, in which case white mixes with white, offspring are white. Or the red uh, male can fertilize a white female, in which case then we're going to get pink. But it's also possible to get pink a different way. We can also get a white male fertilizing a red female. So if that's true and everything just happens randomly, then we expect one quarter of the time red to red will give us red, and one quarter of the time white to white will give us white, and one quarter of the time red to white will give us pink, and another quarter of the time white to red will give us pink. So that means half of the offspring are going to be pink in the next generation. One quarter should be red and one quarter should be white, both in males and females. Okay? Easy? No problem. Let's try it again. In the next generation, what do we expect? And will we see the same colors? Yes, we'll clearly see the same colors. We can get red because red can pollinate red. We can get white. White pollinates white. We can get pink because red can pollinate white still and white can pollinate red. But we can also get pink in a different way. Pink pollinates pink. Because again, just take two different blobs of pink paint, mix them together, you still get pink. But can we get anything different? And again, it's not hard to see that yes, you can. We'll have red could pollinate pink, in which case then we're going to get sort of a darker red or darker pink. It's light red, dark pink. Or pink could pollinate white, or white could pollinate pink, in which case then we get light pink. And if we work out all that mathematics, then we get this sort of relationship. One of these in numbers of dots should be red, one should be white, four should be light pink, four should be dark pink, and the rest should be regular old pink. So 
This case then is what we expect in three generations, but now I want us to continue to do that over and over again. Four generations, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, go up to a hundred, go up to a thousand, go up to a hundred thousand. What will happen? How what will be the color of the flowers after a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand or a million generations? Well, over time, the fluid will simply mix. It'll simply be mixing over and over and over again, all kinds of complex ways, until eventually all the extremes will be washed out. And essentially all the paint that was available will be completely and thoroughly mixed. So that after some number of generations, everybody's essentially going to be pink. Okay, here is the issue. If the generative fluid idea is true, then all human beings on the planet, after the number of generations we've been around, because we've been around for about 200,000 years, all of them should look the same. And we clearly don't. So there's something wrong. There's something that's not right. We use the baloney detection kit. We use the principle of scientific thought that we talked about earlier. Like Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. But here's the point. This part did kind of agree with the experiment. So they knew that's why the generative fluid exi uh, theory existed, because basically this prediction right here is exactly what they saw. What they missed is that over time, everything would have to wash out, and it doesn't. So the generative fluid theory isn't perfect. And they weren't, oh, that's not like everybody believed in generative flu uh, fluid theory. It's just that was one of the major theories uh, that were going at the time of, of about 180 years ago, 1830, 1840. So what is the correct idea? Well, the correct idea was first hit on and first articulated by this gentleman right here, Gregor Mendel. Now, you'll see what he's wearing here looks kind of interesting, and that's because he lived, again, about 180 years ago. He published this in 1835, around that time. He published a paper on experiments that he actually performed in his garden in a city in a country that no longer exists. So what we want to do now is to take a look at what exactly he did that showed that this idea of generative fluid was not correct because this is the beginning of modern genetics but here's where it's dangerous this is just the beginning of modern genetics 180 years ago it is not modern genetics now in 2020 so it's important to keep that in mind and this is why it is that i said if a, if you ask a high school student or, or american university by bi, beginning biology student what would happen in those uh, sorts of, of uh, breedings and they get the answer wrong, it's because they go back to him and they assume that he discovered everything there is to know about genetics, which he did not. He only began modern genetics. We'll talk about that in the next segment.